All right, it is my great honor to introduce Angela Johnson, who's uh, uh, going to speak from her personal experience uh, on entrepreneurship, because a lot of times we get veterans that say that they are considering entrepreneurship. And this uh, presentation is going to be probably one of the best that I've ever heard about entrepreneurship. So I'm looking forward to it. Angela, do you want to introduce yourself? And no pressure. <laughs> yeah. No pressure. Yeah, absolutely. My name is Angela Johnson. Collaborative Leadership Team is the team I serve. That's that's my company. I founded it 12 years ago. It'll be 12 years ago in June. And um, I want to keep this pretty informal. I just uh, mentioned that this will be lessons for entrepreneurs, but from the school of hard knocks. So it's going to be a lot of my experience, not, you know, any any studying or testing involved. Anything else, Alan, or should I dive oh, right in? Kick it off. Go right, right ahead. Awesome. Floor's yours. Okay. Uh, so a little bit about my story. Um, you know, when people talk about starting a business or running a business, do you need to go to school? I always say not necessarily. Did I go to school? Yeah. My degree is in speech communication. So I always say I got a degree in talking. You know, I, I'm one of those people who went to a four-year college and I think I had four or five majors, started off pre-law, decided to be an English major for a month, uh, decided to be in education, elementary education, and then somehow wound up with a degree in speech communication. Um, upon leaving university after four years, I took a job in property management because I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And it was a way to get an apartment that goes along with your job. Okay. But I went to graduate school. So yes, I have a master's degree. Nobody has ever asked me for that as a requirement, nor do I believe that played into me starting my own business. Because um, as I mentioned in the introduction, the School of Hard Knocks is really where I learned the most of what I know about running a business. So 18 years bouncing around as a salaried employee for people after property management, I kind of fell into information technology. I, I started out on a help desk. I, I used to help people troubleshoot these things called modems to dial up to mainframe databases. But the, the organizations that I worked for were really big on training you on the job. So once I worked my way up in the call center and then left that job and found out what other companies were willing to pay people with some technology skills, with some coding skills or database administration skills, I started doing some consulting. Primarily, I was a salaried employee of a consulting firm that would hire me out to other people. And then I started to get wise to how people were making even more money as consultants by taking a higher hourly rate and not getting some of the benefits like paid vacation or things like that. The lingo that that usually refers to people as is W-2, hourly W-2, where you only get paid for the hours you bill or the hours you work. And then you get a you know W-2, so they are withholding taxes and all that happy stuff. Well, after, you know, 18 years of working for other people and watching, you know, the, the margins or the cut that people were taking just to do some paperwork on my services, I decided I'd had enough of being somebody else's employee. So I, I consider myself a broken corporate employee. I think it would be uh, pretty difficult <laughs> for me to have to, um, work for somebody else at this point, because it'll be 12 years in June that I've been an entrepreneur. Did I start out wanting to have a business, have a bricks and mortar space like we do in St. Louis Park, Minnesota? No, I, I literally started off as an army of one, just thinking I'm gonna keep consulting and doing the paperwork for myself so I can get a higher bill rate. So that that's kind of how I started, but today, 12 years later, uh, based in Minneapolis, we're just right outside of Minneapolis in St. Louis Park. 
We have 8,000 square feet. We have um, an event center called West End Conference Center, which is kind of our team's side hustle. Alan did mention that I primarily make my living teaching and coaching Agile and Scrum to students, but then also helping companies who are looking to adopt that, you know, coaching executives and teams and whatnot. My more important roles though are I'm mom to a 10 year old because I started that late in life too, uh, wife, teammate, and I consider myself a lifelong learner. So that's the other thing to point out here about my story is people will think, gosh, do you have to start off when you're young or when you're earlier in your career? No, I um, filed for my business um, with the Secretary of State in Minnesota when I turned 40. So I did this relatively later in my career also. So it's not something that you need to kind of start off uh, wanting to do. So the overarching motto to share with you about my company <laughs> and my team is uh, how hard could it be, right? So I, I filed for the incorporation with the Secretary of State, got my you know, LLC, stood up a website, began running the experiment. That's the easy part. That, that's the easy part. It doesn't even take that long. Right? You can fill out a form on a website. You can get that stuff going relatively quickly. The harder part is if I had to do it all over again, I would have put some thought into the branding. Because when I initially stood up the corporation, it was really to pass through the work that I was doing so that somebody else wasn't making margin on that and have a vehicle to bill for my services. So at the time, I named the company Equitas Consulting. Where did that name come from? Some of you may be familiar with the old Equitas Veritas. Uh, I got that from my love of the movie Boondock Saints, which is a different conversation for another day. And my friend had stood up a company called Veritas. Um, she was doing an advertising agency, you know, Veritas, Truth, Equitas, Justice, Equality, those kinds of things. So I just called it Equitas Consulting. Nobody can pronounce it. Nobody can understand those Latin words. So <laughs> if I had to do it all over again, I probably would have paid more attention to branding. So once the team did start growing, or I started actually having a team, a collaborative leadership team made more sense. And the good news is, if you make some of these mistakes, you can pivot, you can, you can adapt. So not really hard to file a few forms and rename, which we went through that process. The bigger part is deciding what kind of company you want to be. Um, even folks who stand up a limited liability company, like I say, easy, easy to do. When you're trying to do business with other companies, one of the things they're going to look at is their liability in working with you. And LLC kind of screams sole person entity sometimes. There are tax advantages depending on the type of corporate structure you choose. The one that worked out for me, so certainly not trying to turn this into a tax seminar, although after 12 years, <laughs> I feel like I could probably help in some regard there. But the, the type of structure that worked for me was S Corporation. Um, so at the time, I was the sole shareholder in the S Corporation. What that allowed me to do was to run a number of expenses I had through the business, and then the tax on the profit of the business flows through to the shareholder. Well, name of the game, if you have an S corporation is to maximize all those expenses, getting the business to pay for it, but then minimizing the amount of profit that flows through to you as the entity, because then you're tax lower on that. As one example that I share with new entrepreneurs all the time, I don't own my vehicle. The corporation owns my vehicle. Angela Johnson gets the luxury of driving it as an employee of the corporation, but it's, a, it's an expense to the business. Uh, my phone is an expense to the business. So there's a lot of things that 
you can consider going into becoming an entrepreneur proactively to be thinking about uh, tax advantages. And it, since it's almost that day here in April, what a, what a timely topic. So make sure you understand the tax impl implications based on the structure that you choose. And the other thing I like to point out is, remember this, this, this is a job, right? It, it is your job. So it's not something that, you know, um, hey, I'm going to sleep in most days of the week or, hey, you, you work for yourself, so you must have all these luxuries. No, I have a job. And I think that's part of going into thinking about the tax impl implications too, because uh, there are people I know who have what the IRS calls a lifestyle business where they'll work just enough to maintain a particular lifestyle. I'm not saying that's bad. I'm not saying that's good either. It's just a different choice. And so you have to kind of decide going into it, is that what I want? Do I want to work just enough to maintain a certain level of living or do I want to have a business? Am I going to grow this? When I started off, I would say uh, it in many ways was a lifestyle business. For me, I, I just got busy. I just, I just started getting really busy and needing help and started attracting team members to me, you know, like-minded individuals who were interested in helping. And so it's like, oh my gosh, all of a sudden I have a team. So now I need to worry about hiring. And after 12 years, yes, I have had to worry about firing. And so those are the things that I think are the harder part when I say, how hard could it be? But that, that's how the team wound up having an 8,000 square foot event center that we established a couple of years ago too, right? We, we're sitting around my kitchen table talking about how, wouldn't this be great if we had a meeting center? Wouldn't this be great if we had a place to hold our own training classes? And somebody said, well, how hard could it be really? <laughs> so here we are, you know, a couple of years later with a bricks and mortar space in St. Louis Park that you can visit us at. Pay now or pay later. I know so many entrepreneurs who don't want to spend money when you're starting out. And okay, I get that. You know, I only had what little money I was bringing in as a sole practitioner when I started, but I've learned that you either pay up front or you will pay in mistakes later. So I encourage anybody who's looking at starting a business to engage an attorney early on. So I didn't do that when I first started. Uh, I engaged an attorney about four years in, and I wish I had done it sooner. And four years in, what changed was certainly the name. As I mentioned, nobody could pronounce Equitas Consulting, <laughs> who, who speaks Latin. Uh, so in rebranding it, Collaborative Leadership Team, we also wanted to make that legal. So we engaged an attorney to help us not only change the name of the company legally, but also to file for any doing business as, any shorthand around the company name, CLT, co-lead team, you know, so to acquire the doing business as so that a competitor couldn't run out and get those names. The other thing I did is I took on a shareholder. So I sold shares in the business I am the majority shareholder, so I still retain 67.5 uh, shares, so I am the majority shareholder and CEO, but I did award um, an employee who was really helping me grow the business by selling shares of the business to, to that person. And so when I initially did my incorporation, had none of these things in mind. So the poor attorney had to try to look at the, the, the numbers I just plopped in the form <laughs> regarding the, the shares I said the business had initially, which I hadn't given any thought to. So we had to get uh, into lots of revisions there as well. So reviewing our bylaws, reviewing the articles of incorporation, um, and then restructuring those things in taking on the new shareholder allowed us to clean up some of those things. The other thing is engage a business accountant. I made the mistake early on of sticking with the person who had always done my personal taxes. You know, when I made the change to sole practitioner, 
that accountants seem to be able to handle that. Well, now when you start to grow and have things like payroll and a bricks and mortar space and all these other expenses as the business grew, that accountant was not well versed in those things. And because they made their living primarily off of just doing people's individual tax returns, they weren't staying current with all the tax law revisions that were getting passed for businesses. So I would go in there after reading something about S corporations and what I should be able to take advantage of. And my accountant just wasn't versed in that. And so when we did acquire a business accountant later on, who was versed in that, we'll now rack up the fees on all the amended returns. So that's why I say pay now or pay later. So it may seem like, oh, I got to go get these professionals and they all cost money. They're worth every penny. And it doesn't cost a lot. It's not like you need to keep them on retainer or, you know, keep paying. These are very simple targeted things that any good business attorney or business accountant should be able to help you get going. And then hopefully you don't need their, their services in the long run. But I did. Uh, engage an employment attorney. The employment laws, uh, if you are going to take on employees, differ from state to state. And so in Minnesota, we're not a right to work state. We are an at will state. So employers can hire and fire at will. Employees can quit at will, unless you have some sort of a contract, unless you have some sort of agreement that puts in other stipulations. Because I'm in a services business and our intellectual property is our livelihood, I needed to put in those other stipulations, non-disclosures, um, uh, protection for non-compete so that somebody couldn't leave with the client base or a list of clients and those kinds of things. And not only were those employment attorneys worth every penny to structure those agreements, unfortunately, those agreements have been tested. <laughs> So like I say, school of hard knocks. So we did have, you know, a former employee try to uh, take our intellectual property and profit from it. So thank goodness for those binding agreements. Um, we did have somebody try to take our client list. So thank goodness for those agreements. So it may seem like it's um, a lot to think about, but it's, it's definitely worth every penny, pay now or pay later. The other thing I point out to people who think they really want to grow a business, um, certainly not if you're going to do a lifestyle business and it's just going to be you, because then what I've shared so far pretty much will cover you. But if you're going to grow the business or this is going to be your livelihood long term, you know, I'm saying this in my 12th year, got to understand the grind. And there are going to be days where it is a grind. Our, our team will even uh, joke about that old Dunkin' Donuts commercial, the guy who makes the donuts, and he's like, time to make the donuts. Like, we have been known to say that some days. And so if we have more than a lifestyle business, we're going to have to be a slave to the grind. Liking what you do helps. I like teaching. I, I love helping people. I love coaching. Um, so when the grind sets in, that gets me through because I get to come to things like this. I get to help veterans like you all um, re-enter the workforce. I, I love helping people. At the end of the day, there are things I don't like. Don't like talking to the accountant at this time of the year all the time. <laughs> don't like a lot of the paperwork that I have to do, but I have to do it because I enjoy having a team of people. I enjoy having employees. And so at the end of the day, I have the business to run. I have experimented with offloading some of those tasks to other people. And for me, that hasn't worked out. Um, either they haven't understood that, you know, when payroll needs to be run, it needs to be run. You can't just sleep in. You can't just miss that deadline. Um, you, there's other considerations that they may not have fully understood. And so at the end of the day, I'm responsible 
I'm still responsible as the owner of the company. So if you're going to offload it to someone, you have to make sure that at the end of the day, you know, you're still responsible, but you have to trust that person and they have to be understanding this is a job. This is a job. Routines help. I know um, people who are like me or similar in the same profession who will say, gosh, why, you know, why is your team so successful or, or how have you been able to do this for 12 years? You know, I can barely make it one year or during COVID. Um, a friend of mine who has a very similar business had to let their whole team go. And I think to myself, well, I've never treated this as if it was a lifestyle business. I've never treated this as if it was just something I do. And then I work a few days a week. When I talk to this friend of mine, there are days where they, oh yeah, I slept in today. Or I would try to schedule a call and they'd be like, well, I'm going to go work out at this time. Or I'm going to go do this lunch. Or I'm going to go golf. Or I'm going to run errands. Or I'm going to do these things. And it's like, I'm working. <laughs> this is my job. Uh, so routines can really help you if you treat it like a nine to five, even if there's days when you're not sure what's going to hit your calendar or what you're going to do with your time. Before I had my office, I would still get up at the same time every day. I would dress like I was going to the office every day at the same time. And there are days that I would just go to a coffee shop, you know, go to a caribou and I'd wind up striking up conversations with people or I'd get an ad hoc meeting with a client and I would say, hey, meet me at this caribou, you know, that I was already at. And so there's things you can do to just establish that routine until it comes to fruition that the job is just your routine. And I think that's important. I think that there's people who miss that, that, that don't understand that this is your job. Read the fine print. No, really read the fine print. Um, we have an interview question on our team about reading comprehension and people laugh and ask us if it's serious. And we're like, yes, because we can't have more people join the team who don't read the fine print. And I, I even tell my, my 10 year old helping him with his homework, you know, every bad thing that's happened to your mom uh, with her job has been because she didn't read the fine print. And when you do read it, then you're prepared for the consequences you're about to accept. You understand the choices in front of you. If you take somebody at their word, no matter how much you trust them and you smile and nod, be prepared if whatever you signed that you didn't read comes back to bite you. Um, the one in particular for our small team is the lease that uh, we are living under right now for our bricks and mortar space. There was uh, a lease negotiated and in the 11th hour, the landlord was selling the building where we were leasing space. And I trusted the agent, you know, that nothing had changed and it had, but I signed it anyway. And then poof, they were gone because the new landlord took over. And even though I could have fought that, I could have, you know, I did talk to the attorney and should have had him just give it one more glance over, but I didn't. And so we're making it work. We're adapting, but there's things that, you know, we were promised in that process that didn't come to fruition. And all the poor new landlord can do is go, I have this to fall back on. You know, I have what's in writing. So I can encourage you to do anything, <laughs> it's read, read the fine print. And if you sincerely don't understand it or don't have the, the patience for it, because I don't have a lot of patience for the, that sometimes, I'll get somebody else to do it, right? I'll, I, I will engage a, an attorney or an accountant to look it over and say, I have no problem with you then explaining it to me. But at the end of the day, if you can uh, teach yourself that patience to, to read, that, that will go a long way. So I am looking forward to the q and I, I am just anxious for all the questions you all have. So Ellen, you'll have to let me know at what point you want to hit the yeah. stop on the record and we can just chat. Absolutely. We'll stop recording now.